Hi, I'm John, the engineer Termel, and I just laid the worst beating on Dave Do Nothing Levac, incumbent in Brantford, at last night's St. George meeting in front of 50 people. And now tonight, in front of televised audiences, I've been excluded. So, take a look at the beating I laid on Dave last night, because you ain't going to see me get to lay it on him again tonight. You got the Chamber of Commerce crooks who do the cheating, and then you got Rogers who just cover the cheating of their teammates in this effort. So, here it is. Okay, so I probably hold the Guinness record as the candidate taken into custody by police most often during election debates. Over my, this is my 80th election, 80 elections, I must have been arrested 50, 60, 100 times because if they're going to cheat me, they're going to need maximum force and that takes a badge. And anytime a moderator tried to move me on his own, he ended up on his back. Jiu-Jitsu John. A little flip, they're gone. So, last election in Brant, provincial, four years ago, out of 10 meetings, I was invited to four and I was excluded from six. So that means I was going to go and I was going to bust up six meetings by walking in, taking a seat, <clears throat> saying, I'm staying. I paid my ticket. I'm on the ballot. What right do you have to change the rules of qualification? Get a badge. <laughs> then I heckle them for 15, 20, 30 minutes until the badge shows up and takes me away. Okay? You understand how that kind of resistance to their cheating me works every time? So, not tonight, maybe, but anyway. Last election, four times cops took me away. And the last two times, they let me stay. They didn't want to have the cops take me away. So, paid off. Getting arrested four times got me into two extra debates to get my message about my Let's Time Bank software. Remember now, it's an idea where all the single mothers in a poor area can log on and list what nights they're free to babysit each other's kids. And that way one does three kids or three families while the other two ladies go out and party, have a break once in a while. Let's time bank. They pay each other with one hour bills, even if they're broke. Next thing you know, mechanic wants some, three hours per hour. Dentist wants some, eight hours per hour. Whatever. Everybody can use babysitting bucks. And that's how a let's time bank works. So that's why I take every opportunity and I will fight for it because someone might catch on and set up their own rights. When I ran in 1996 against Sheila Copps, the headline was Super Loser Fails Again. And exactly one month later, big article, Hamilton Help Self-Help Group sets up Hamilton Let's. Didn't even have to get elected. So I've been running in Brad for 11 years trying to get Let's Time Bank in there. But last election, one in particular, the university women of Brantford, the most educated elite, have decided that they've come up with a new qualification for excluding me. I forget what it was. I showed up, did the usual routine, grabbed a seat, started heckling them for being a bunch of undemocratic, crooked commies. And then Dave, who's never backed me up before, always sat there and watched the cops take me away. I considered him no balls, Dave. Stands up, goes, gets a table, she sets it up, gets me a chair, invites me to sit, and I figure, ah, Dave must have talked the organizers into getting me in. Yay! So I sit down. Don't forget, in the past, Bob Mitchell once yelled at them and they let me in. And anyway, the point is, there are good guys who stand up for their opponents, and there are the weaklings like Dave. Now, Dave shouldn't be in this kind of upper echelons where our rights are at stake. I trust them to take care of my garbage municipally, but I don't trust them to take care of my rights. So here I am waiting for, you know, the meeting to start happy. I'm in, okay? And all of a sudden, five, ten minutes later, in come the cops. Dave tricked me into shutting up until the cops could show up. I guess he wanted a big, big hero to the ladies. Watch this. I'll shut him up till the cops get here. And he did. Worked. Payback, Dave. Anyway, that was at the, uh, now what else? Okay, now, if you go listen to Dave in this upcoming debate, you're going to hear him tell you about his vision for Brantford. 
which in 11, 13 years he ain't been able to accomplish, and all the good things he wants for us and he's working towards and negotiate. Oh, this is a master negotiator. Never solves anything, but he sure knows his negotiations. Anyway, I made fun of him as do-nothing Dave. I put the boots to him like he's never had the boots put to his brain before. I pointed out that every single mother who ever committed suicide out of depression would still be around if the dumb voters in Branford had voted for me and Let's instead of do nothing Dave, right? So, pretty bad. And it upset a lot of people. What do I care? Here's Dave saying, get out and vote. Just do your duty. Hey, if you don't know what's happening and you're sitting at home waiting for your free ride out of Dave's chauffeurs to the polling booth and then to the party, but you ain't listening to nothing, what are you going for? You got nothing to offer. You don't know what's going on. People who don't know what's going on shouldn't get out and vote, no matter how it helps Dave. So... Oh, get out and vote and his vision. Now, finally, why the hat? People ask me why the hat, Johnny Engineer. Well, I just want people to remember who and what did him in. So, if you like Johnny Engineer, enjoy Blood on the Floor. And if you don't, tough luck. Eat your heart out. But here are the reports. Guess what? Right now, there's going to be a big TV debate tonight, and I'm going to get to really do it. Instead of 50 people in a live meeting, this is like 5, 10, 15, 20,000 voters tonight. Oh, 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 it's being run by the Brantford Chamber of Commerce. Jeez, that's the rich guys. You know, they got no morals. Oh, and it's being covered by Rogers. Guess what? They've come up with new rules little different than the Ontario government rules to get on the ballot. Their new rules say you have to have a chance. John Turmel of the Popper Party and the guy of the Freedom Party have not been invited to participate because only those candidates representing parties with nominated candidates in the majority of election ridings in Ontario are invited to participate. So the more candidates you got, the more brains you must have, right? No way a minority opinion can be right. Of course, any right opinion always starts with a minority of one. But, oh, we've only got two or three. Gee, take it in. We don't have a majority of the writings covered. So that is the fraudulent excuse used by the Board of Trade, led by Alan Lowett, a lawyer. Ah, oh, shysters again, with Winter Household and Army and Hitchin. And he's the chamber's second vice president. A shyster in charge. Yes, sir, what would he know about democracy? So I'm excluded from tonight's debate. And even though I slapped Dave all around the stage last night, threw blood on his hands, people thought it was a bloodletting. I made a lot of people mad, you'll see. Oh, here's a report out of the newspaper saying, John Turmel of the Popper Party. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. This is it. John Turmel of the Popper Party. No, that's not wrong. <laughs> Cut this out. Uh, Termel does not deserve to be invited to any of the debates. His behavior was an absolute disgrace at an all-candidates meeting in St. George. We can disagree without being disagreeable. Well, I just can't be agreeable to Dave after he helped me get arrested quietly, right? Policy criticism are a fair game. Okay, not voting for let's had a lot of dead suicided mothers, and you're the guys who voted to put do-nothing Dave in. Not personal attacks. Hey, the man had me arrested. What do you want me to say? And threats. Hey, anybody wants to touch Jiu-Jitsu John, they're going to get hurt unless they got a badge. Right. So, that happened last night. Didn't make the news. Uh, the Brant News reported that I said I didn't have a solution to something because it was too complicated. And then cut out the punchline. Where was the last time you heard John the Engineer, who has game theory to solve any problem for the winningest solution, say, I don't have a solution to a problem? Well, that's Natalie Patton who sleezed that out of context shot, okay? So anyway, her highest qualification in journalism, and she only got a D- minus in her technical course, was Tape Recorder 101, and she should have failed. So here we go on to the big debate. For those who like me, enjoy it. For those who hate my guts, eat your heart out. Our St. George All Candidates meeting. I'd like to thank the organizers of the meeting for 
that's not going to help my riding. The first time I met Dal McGinty, I said to him, I'm running for the Liberals, but if you ask me to choose between the party and my riding, I choose my riding. And if that riding asks me to choose between them and my family, I choose my family. And I know that all of you think the same way. And I love to bring our message of hope and the dreams and our aspirations to Queen's Park and having them help us do what we need to do and not have Queen's Park tell us what we have to do. So on June 12th, vote for Hobart.
in advance of, uh, of June 12th and, and casting a ballot on, on June 12th. I also am a, a resident of, of Brant. I uh, have a small uh, renewable energy business here, and I work uh, in Brant, and I've also uh, commuted to Toronto um, for work. So I've been both a, a business owner in the community and, and also a commuter. I'm also a woodlot owner here in the community and a member of, of several committees, uh, both in Brantford and in Brant. Got a good idea? More important. Uh, to me is getting involved and getting engaged in your community and that's what all of you are doing here tonight is getting engaged in your community, getting engaged in this discussion. Part of the reason that I decided to run as a candidate is because I am concerned that politics is broken right now. In the last election only 50% or just under 50% of the people voted and that's people that were so discouraged by what they see at Queen's Park, so discouraged by the petty and partisan politics that are getting in the way of good policy that they don't even uh, come out to vote anymore. They didn't know about the left. That's why. Excuse me. Sorry. John, if you please refrain. I'm trying to make it entertaining. Please refrain. He's boring. Start again. Um, <laughs> we, need to, we need to focus on long-term policy that puts the people first. We need to return honesty, integrity, and good policy to Queen's Park. And that starts with an honest conversation about the opportunities and challenges ahead of us. And, and a, an honest conversation with Ontarians, because I think that part of the problem is, is that decisions are being made behind closed doors, that people aren't being given the truth, that, that policies are being drafted with partisan interest, policies are being drafted to try and get votes, and not thinking about good, good policy and putting the people first. So I'm looking forward to an honest conversation uh, with Ontarians about that. And the other reason that I'm running is because I believe in the potential of Brant along those lines. Brantford and Brant and Six Nations together as three communities have an incredible potential to lead the way as a sustainable community. Dave mentioned some of the, the features of our community along that way and saying we have incredible potential as a trio of communities to be able to demonstrate the best in sustainable development that our rural, urban and First Nations uh, communities can present together. So we're presenting a platform that's based on the building a rich and resilient economy, giving our children the best opportunity they can to thrive in our future, and protecting the places we love, protecting our farmland and source water, and we'll talk more about that. So thank you very much for everybody for coming out tonight and listening and engaging in this debate, and please do vote on June 12th.
understand the needs uh, facing today's families and businesses. An NDP government will focus on fundamentals. This is creating jobs, making life more affordable, improving health care, and making government accountable. On the doorsteps, people are so excited to hear our message and the change that, and recognize that Andrea Horgoff is the only leader who's making sense. Too many families are left waiting for care, trying to juggle caring for an aging parent while sending kids to school. Our plan provides relief to those who are overstretched families, including a fully refundable caregiver tax credit. From speaking with young people, I know that new graduates are struggling to find work to be able to afford to pay off their overwhelming student debts. Temp agencies are out of control in our body. And people keep, and they keep people at what should be good paying local jobs. No strings attached giveaways for corporations have not delivered jobs. And it's time we end this tired approach and reward job creators with a targeted tax credit. Wait times at our hospital are still very high. For anyone who's been recently, will know. Um, now, Tim Hudak and Phil Gilly's plan is to cut 100,000 frontline workers, but that doesn't make any sense. We, as New Democrats, will cut ER wait times in half by hiring 250 new nurse practitioners. Uh, and this is a model that's tried and proven at St. Mike's Hospital in Toronto. It does reduce wait times by half. Skyrocketing energy prices are another concern that are killing jobs, squeezing families, and leaving many seniors out in the cold. Our plan will make life more affordable by reducing hydro bills and auto insurance rates for hardworking middle class families. We can create jobs by rewarding job creators and small business. We can make life more affordable by reducing your hydro bills and saving you money on auto insurance. We can end the scandals and waste of public tax dollars. We can invest in your priorities, starting with health care and education. It's time for change. People in Ontario do not have to choose between failed conservative agenda or a corrupt liberal government. People are ready for change that respects their hard work, provides opportunities for families, and stands up for what's right. New, new Democrats will get the job done. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Bill Gillies. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for having me here tonight along with our fellow candidates. Um, I was just here in this hall last night for the concert for curtains. So last night it was bagpipes in here and tonight it's politicians. I hope you can tell the difference. Um, so I, th I know many of you in the room. I uh, grew up in Brantford, of course, went to school there, worked there. I was the MPP for the old writing of Brantford uh, for two terms. And uh, after some years in, in business life, uh, and, uh, and happy to join my fellow candidates in this race. Uh, to see who will be representing Brand Writing after June the 12th. So, um, I believe that this current Ontario election is one of the most important in our province's history. Our voters are faced with a stark choice. Do we want more of the mismanagement, waste and scandal that we have suffered under the Liberal government? Or do we want change? Do we want nothing done to address our record high debt, deficit and taxes? Or do we want leader, more efficient government that respects the taxpayer's ability to pay? Do you want your hydro rates, already the highest in North America, to go up another 40% in the next five years, as will happen if the Liberals are re-elected? Or do you want something done to keep energy affordable? Should we have to suffer through four more years of billion dollar scandals? like the politically motivated gas plant disaster, the orange air ambulance mess, and the e-health situation, all of them sinkholes for money, your money. And these things have plagued us, I believe, far too long. Or do you want change? And that's what I'm hearing on the doorsteps, and that's what I'm hearing in the coffee shops. People want change. They want a government that will respect them 
and it will start living within its means. They want integrity and openness, not a premier's office that is under three separate OPP investigations. Change is what the Ontario PCs and I are offering. A program that will grow new and existing businesses, large and small, through tax cuts. A program that will create hundreds of thousands of new jobs and stop the private sector job drain of the Liberal years. A new energy program that will give a break to homeowners and industry uh, by reclaiming one of Ontario's traditional strengths, which is affordable energy. I'm looking forward so much uh, to hearing your questions and comments this evening. I'm the kind of person and the kind of politician who has always seen differing views as something to be learned from as opposed to something to be dismissed. And so uh, thank you for having me and uh, let's hope we have a great evening. Thank you. Six 
Nations is successful, Brantford and Brant. And when Brantford is successful, Brant and Six Nations. Thank you. Next speaker will be John Master of Boolean Algebra and Logic. This is my case in federal court. 250 medical applicants want their marijuana or they're going to die and we're going to have repeal next month. Now my argument, I'm healthy. I'm saying I want it to prevent what it's good for once you get it, before you get it. And I also want it since a new 2006 article by University of Saskatchewan says it grows new brain cells. I told the judge I want as many new brain cells as I can get. So that explains marijuana. Why I'm so sharp and they're so dull. Now, this question here about what do we do if Queen's Park offers guidance and imposes a solution? They got no solution, right? I can't think of one. What kind of guidance do you expect from them in their sandbox? Gotta think outside the sandbox, Dave. Anyway, my thinking outside the sandbox is I got enough money. Now, if all these guys had enough money, and they weren't all so broke. You think they'd be arguing about the deal so much? And if there's a way where they can save all the interest and debt service, the morons are now throwing away, and they've got that extra debt service to pay and have a different kind of a negotiation, maybe that's solvable. So I got no clue how to solve this. But I know Dave in his sandbox no clue either, and to say, will they impose a solution when they ain't got one? And will they impose guidance when they ain't got none? Well, that's silly, isn't it? Don't worry, this goes out on the internet, so you don't have to get it. Next speaker. Ken Burke. Thanks very much. Well, uh, a lot of people have heard me uh, talk about this, and I believe a local solution is the only solution, and I want to pick up on uh, some of the themes that Dave talked about. But for me, it's not a, a question, it is about negotiation, but it's not a question of boundary adjustment. It's about cooperation and collaboration between the three communities, not about annexation uh, of one community by another. I think that the, the local solution that needs to be discussed more is how the three uh, communities, Brantford, Brant, and Six Nations can work together because I do agree that what's good for one of the communities is good for all of the communities. The de economic development in Brant, if there's new uh, jobs and new employers that locates in Brant, that benefits Six Nations and it benefits Brantford as well. And the same goes all around. I think for each of the three communities, I'm, I'm a huge proponent that Brantford needs to build up and not spread out. It's better for all of the communities. It's more expensive for the city of Brantford to spread out and continue to develop subdivisions the way that it has in the past. It's more expensive to deliver the services like transit, infrastructure, water, sewage, roads, you name it. It's more expensive to do it in subdivisions than it is to build up. We can, uh, it's more expensive to the extent, in London they did a study on it, it was two and a half billion dollars. I'm already at a time and I barely feel like I got started on this. So I'm going to have to jump to the end. We need to build up, not uh, spread out because it's better for the community. We need to protect our farmland and source water for the intrinsic value they provide, as well as the economic drivers that they provide. The farms are the economic driver. We need to support the farmers, and we need to change the laws. Places to grow and places to grow legislation is the root of the problem that we have. So what would I do would be to address that, address our population growth that supports the people of Grant, Grant County, and Six Nations. Thank you very much.
and we need to respect that. So if I was elected, I would fight for that honest belief that it's no. This is your property, you should enjoy your property. Thank you.
the rest of the negotiation through the LIN and the government, through the Ministry of Health, that we'll finally have for our region a detox rehabilitation center. If we do not deal with this, we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on all the peripheral agencies that we have. Can you imagine the improvements that we could, we could implement by having detox center rehabilitation so that the addict is no longer a stress on the system, their family and loved ones? It's, it's, it's here, it's happening, and I'm proud of the fact that I used my leadership to pull us all together to actually have it built. Okay. Yes, I, no disagreement uh, on this issue. I have some experience in this area. In my professional life, I've done consulting work for the Canadian Centre on Substance Abuse. Uh, I've actually been to uh, one of the planning meetings and cons consultation meetings that they've had last year, and uh, I, I totally agree. Uh, we need a, a, a rehab and a detox centre. Um, in my meetings with the Brand Community Health System, I've been told there is a lot of strain on active care beds at $1,100 a day. People who are in those beds because of addiction problems related to drugs and alcohol. The strain on our, uh, on our emergency wards also. And if you talk to the Chief of Police in Brantford, he'll tell you that approximately 80% of the crime in Brantford is drug related. So we have to do something new, we have to do something bold to address this, and, uh, and I, I really do think that a, a rehab and a detox center is the way to go.
trades. We, we believe is really just a thinly veiled cash grab. Uh, the College of Trades is regulating any number of new trades uh, that have been, in many cases, self-regulating in the past. So they're levying a charge, an annual fee, against hairdressers, against uh, people who do framing on construction sites, against uh, uh, any number of, of, uh, of, uh, of areas. And it's very expensive, and it's causing grief for a lot of people who are trying to make a living. So it's going to drive up costs of construction, it's going to drive up the cost of any number of, of things that you access. It, it, and the hairdressers are very upset about this, that they're being forced into the college. So we don't think it's the way to go. Uh, we think it's just another way, frankly, for, uh, for the government to take money, uh, along with the WSIB changes under Bill 119 last year that are hitting the same people very, very hard. Thank you, Phil. Is there anybody else at the table who would like to comment on this? I'm not so sure I want uh, 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 people who are not uh, overseen coming to do work on my home. That would concern me. Thank you. But you've got to trust the community. People who have been in business for 30 years have more experience than the NDP and their magic wand creating jobs. To be clear, the impression that got left to you is that the government is taking the money. It's for the trades themselves. It's a fee that you annually pay into the college to be the regulator of your industry. So it has no bearing. There's not a nickel that will go back to the government under that program. It's very similar to the teacher's college, the nurse's college, the doctor's college, the ECE college. All of the colleges that are self-regulating, that's what this is a creation of. So are they afraid that the trades don't deserve to be considered to be high-level professionals that need to have that done? And quite frankly, it's a wonderful concept and an idea to get rid of the underground economy for those people that are doing things that don't pay taxes. So that's another reason why it's a valuable exercise. And it's not going to take that split of 120 bucks a year. That's it. That's what you try to portray as this robbery of the government. It's not true. Thank you. Somebody else? No, just like Dave didn't have enough money for the detox center, he won't have enough money to keep your thing alive. But if you were to understand how the Argentine solution worked, and you and your people were to accept those bonds as a new kind of money, well then we could keep them alive and more. So the question is, you can vote for him for more than nothing, or you can vote for me for the Argentine solution. Duh! Thank you. investing in your education, you are investing in getting certified, and when you get into the industry not being undercut by people who haven't made that uh, investment, who aren't certified, and who don't necessarily know what they're doing, you may also be taking advantage of the consumer and giving your trade a bad reputation. So I think that there is protection in there for you and value for the trades as well from that perspective. Thank you. Next question. Your name and where you live. My name's Mary and I live in St. George. Um, my question is for Phil Gillies. Um, I've been an educational assistant for 25 years with the Grand Jury School Board. Um, my understanding is that your party is wanting to cut upwards of 10,000 EAs. And I'm just wondering, if it's not so much for myself because it's probably not going to affect me. I'm high enough on the seniority list. But I'm concerned for the children that I work with that they're not going to have the help they need to be successful. Uh, just to be clear, our proposal is to reduce the size of the greater public service by 10%. Now, the greater public service, since the Liberals came to power in 2003, has grown by 300,000 people. By reducing it by 100,000, we're only taking the profits back to the employment levels that were in place in 2009. Now, Dave, you, you've been at Queen's Park for 15 years, and I don't remember you saying that the staffing levels were inadequate for the first 10 years that you were at Queen's Park. Secondly, the government brought in one of the top economists in the country, Don Drummond, to do the Drummond Report, which made recommendations about what the province needed to do to bring the economy uh, and government spending under control. 
the Drummond Report recommended exactly this, a reduction by 100,000. And the government chose not to accept the advice of its own best advice, which was from uh, Don Drummond. The other thing is, it's, it strikes me as a little disingenuous that the federal government under Paul Martin did exactly what we're proposing to do. They realized that they had a problem with growing bureaucracy and greater numbers in the public service. They took steps federally to do it. And at the time, the liberals called that sound fiscal management. Now that we're proposing the same thing, they call it draconian. My understanding is, though, the 10,000 e educational assistants are being cut in addition to the 100,000 public sector workers. A lot, a lot, let's be clear, there are not going to be mass pink slips given out to people. A lot of what we're proposing can be done by attrition. In the greater public service in Ontario, 50,000 people retire every year. If, if those retirees are not replaced for two, three years, we will meet our goal. Yes! We need more death! Uh, thank you. So, you know, I agree that there's room to find efficiencies uh, within things like ministers' office budgets, but not with our frontline workers. Because still, uh, Mr. Hudak and Mr. Gillies have not been clear about which workers will be on the chopping block because our public sector workers are our nurses, there are teachers, there are EAs. There are firefighters and there are policemen. And I find it very difficult to um, be clear with this because many of us will remember when Harris uh, came to power and he was asked how many hospitals will have to close as a result of these cuts. And he said, none. You have my word. How many hospitals closed? 28. So I just don't accept that children in our schools who need additional support will be forced to go without because already there isn't enough support for children in our schools who are struggling. Uh, and that's why in the NDP we've said we will increase the number of educational assistants by a thousand to ensure that the children who need the support to be successful will be successful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. I think uh, you're making an excellent point. And right now, uh, Ontario has another problem as well, which is that we're sending our special needs children home early because we don't have the resources to support them in the classroom, and that's absolutely unconscionable. The Green Party is proposing to merge the Catholic and public school boards and save about 1.6 billion in duplicate administration and busing kids past perfectly good publicly funded schools, and merge, it, merge the two school boards into one English and French system so that we can invest that money back into our classroom, back into the, uh, putting the education in the, in the children's children first so we can have more special needs uh, support services so that we can have more <coughs> educational support in the classroom and less administration. We'll save $1.6 billion busing, from busing our kids back past perfectly good schools. So thank you very much. We do support the
explained before, get the government to pay you with small denomination paper you can spend for hydro, taxes, medical, and licenses, and it'll be as good as money, and you won't lose your jobs, and I won't consider you inferior to the Argentine teachers. Get it? Pretty good, eh? He's got an answer. Sorry. Give us your answer. He should be. We shut him down. He should be. Marilyn, thank you for your question. The short answer is I did state that they were going to get rid of 10,000 PAs. And that's on top of the 100,000 uh, people that they were going to get pay stubs to. And their idea of attrition, and they made a statement during the, the, the election, that they include maternity leave as part of that. So someone's from maternity leave. That counts for their numbers. So the fudging is going on, and I gotta tell you, we fought for and got more EAs into the system than ever before. And that reality is gonna stay put when we're re re reelected. Thank you. Thanks. Your name and Trevor Struga, Frankfurt. Brantford area into Brant, 
Uh, we propose to do that through uh, making this the most attractive jurisdiction in North America to start and grow a business. 30% corporate tax cut is, is part of our proposal. We want to get control of energy costs because that is a big thing for a lot of companies. So we have the highest energy costs in North America now. The, uh, if the Liberals are re-elected, you're going to see them go up another 40% in five years. Plus their proposals uh, to increase uh, payroll taxes. We also have the highest payroll taxes in all of Canada. If the Liberals are elected, uh, they're going to bring in this pension scheme of theirs, which is for a typical worker, going to take about another thousand dollars out of their pocket and a thousand dollars out of the employer's pocket. It all makes us very unattractive uh, to start and grow businesses. And so we are going to reverse those trends, tax cuts, get control of energy costs, and make this a place that people want to come and start and grow a business. Then you will have a lot of clients for your marketing firm. Thank you, Phil. Well, what Phil's talking about is that he, their party is rejecting a, a pension plan for 70% of the population of Ontario. And he wants to call that a payroll tax. What it is is that it's going to be a shared responsibility between the employer and the employee up to 1.9% so that they can retire with about twenty dollars to $25,000 instead of the lock-in CPP maxed at $14,000 annually for a pension. I honestly believe that people are perceiving this to be a progressive and a rather bold move to ensure that people who are not saving and un re re regrettably, there's nobody saving for the future. If that's the statistic that's out there. But let's come back to the reality of what you're doing. You have to also understand, that's a million dollar house that you have to buy in Toronto. What we're buying here is about a $230,000 house. They sell their houses for a million dollars down there. They come back here and buy their houses for around two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollars, and they want to have the same. They want to bring all the prices down. That's pressure on you as well, and that's the, the, the reality of regional kind of economics. But there are some things that can be done, and I agree with what Alex is talking about. I started to bring this up in caucus a long time ago about these agencies that are coming up. They've reinvented themselves. They still have value. It's important to understand that when you break your arm, I need another secretary, I can get somebody quick, take it in a short part and move them out. That was the reality of temp agencies. They're causing a problem for us by removing that middle piece that's for the person that can spend that disposable income for you. So if we've got those temp agencies under control in their car, I don't believe in a total ban, but I also believe in control. So what's been happening under those circumstances, we've removed some of those nuggets that they were taking from the company and from them, and we've said you can't do that anymore, and guess what's happening? They're getting those wages a little bit higher each time that they have to move forward. So when that starts to happen, that cash flow comes back to you, and you can start moving your prices back up, and you become successful. And contrary to what my esteemed colleague has told you, the, the pension is an important issue in the province of Ontario. All we have to do now is get the feds on site and go straight to the CPP, which is a very fluid and very important program that everyone in Canada pays for. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much, Trevor. That's an excellent question. I'm, I, I won't dwell on it, but I also agree that we certainly need to talk, uh, have a conversation with employers about how to encourage full-time employment that has a living wage and a, and a real wage and talk about the quality of employment and reducing the role and the reliance that we see right now on, on the temp agencies. I think that we have to also uh, rely on ourselves. And I say that because the corporate tax breaks are not going to create jobs. I'll give a, a quick example, I hope it's quick, that Unilever just announced in Brampton the closing of its plan and the loss of almost 300 uh, jobs in that particular community. Unilever is a sustainable company. I, I like them. They, Paul Polson is, uh, has won awards for sustainability. It's not a company I'm trying to pick on. But they, in 2013, earned worldwide revenues of $65 billion. On that, they made profit of $6.5 billion. They paid Paul Polson $11 million in overall compensation for the year. For anybody to do the math, that's $2,750 an hour that he earned if he worked 80 hours a week. And he only earned $11 million in compensation relative to executive salary. That's on the, on the low end. My point in all this is that corporate tax cuts aren't going to save jobs. No corporate tax jobs were going to save those jobs. Sorry, no corporate tax cuts 
we're going to save those jobs in Brampton. We have to think differently. We have to invest in ourselves. We have to invest in our small businesses. We also have to, from the green policy perspective, invest in people's homes. Nobody here can promise you that they can bring energy prices down. A lot of people talk about rising energy prices, and energy prices are going to go up. We have to deal with this problem now. We've been subsidizing the cost of energy for too long, and we have to do that. We have to make our homes and businesses more affordable and competitive. And we can do that by uh, cancelling our investment in uh, new nuclear. We'll save about a billion dollars a year. We can bring in low-cost water power from Quebec at a fraction of the cost. And we can invest that in people's homes, helping them make more energy efficient and conser conservation in their homes. And that will create about 56,000 jobs, helping people save money by saving energy. So we'll create good local jobs in our community, helping renovators have jobs, helping us invest in our homes and save money today, tomorrow, and in the long run. Hi, that's a lot of it. It's hard to get a definitive answer. My fellow candidates have got comment a little bit. I firmly believe that businesses are the key to that. But the other element of that is the cost of living that some of the other candidates have talked about as well. The reason our cost of living is so high is because of government control rates. We open up the market and allow you a choice. You want to pay the government rates or another rate. Use the phone company. At one point we had a phone company and they want $400 a month, you had to pay if you wanted a phone. And we open up the market now they have internet companies, television companies. We have hundreds of different companies that you can choose. We're forced to pay that and lower his rights. And the same thing can happen with any uh, utility. Now the NDP talk about temps and the service talk about temps. One of the biggest strains to an employer is being forced. Forced into things such as paying more of minimum wage. We see $11 an hour, but the employer sees much more. There's much more tax that the employer has to pay. So every time the minimum wage goes up, you've created temp jobs.
to actually most of the panel, but particularly to uh, our local members who elect. And it concerns the local health integration network. Not that uh, organization in general, but our particular network. I would ask, sir, if you could provide us with the total budget figures of our particular local health integration network. And then secondly, the salaries of the executives, including the benefits of our link.
more frontline workers to address uh, the needs of people in all of our communities. But I still don't understand how are we going to get more frontline workers and invest dollars in frontline workers like nurses, uh, like PSWs, um, with Mr. Hudak's plan to cut 100,000 public service workers. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't add up. One thing the NEP will do is create a, an additional 1,400 long-term beds that will eliminate completely the crisis uh, wait times for these beds. And this is something that as we see a growing population uh, of seniors uh, every year, this is a need that uh, we need to fill now because already the wait list is too long and people are going to bed. Can I be permitted a one? You said we could do a one liner, maybe west during the debate. Okay, thank you. The materials blue. No, but Mark, I'm not going to lie. I do want to comment on the wait times in the hospitals. Right now, the ministry gives 100,000 people, you get one ER doctor. That should be put in priority of the hospital. On Friday nights, we see 300 people need two doctors. Now, since you brought up the PSW issue, for about eight months now, I've looked at PSWs, PSW seniors, and I've been disabled in the community. That the minister is responsible for seniors' response saying they're there. The minister of health saying they're there. I've extended my invites on this issue about seniors and disabled to all of these people. But the only one who showed up was Mark Ferrier of the NDP. How dare they sit here and talk about what's prior? I have a 94 year old man who's a World War II veteran in this community wanting help from his government, and you all said no. On October, on, on June 12th, I say yes. Okay, thank you. One line. One line. It is right in the PC Party platform. We are not taking a dollar out of health care. That's very clear. We and are going to flatten line. administration and, and put it in the front line service. Next question. I got land for sale. Where? <laughs> That's my swamp word. land. <laughs> In Florida. My name is Nora. You can live between Paris and St. George. My question has to do with my concern about our democracy when fewer than 50% are probably going to be voting in this election. And I have talked to so many people and said, have you any idea what it cost in the past for you to have the right to vote and now you don't want to vote? Well, many people say to me, I have voted so many times and I've never elected the winner. So I feel that the government does not represent me. So my question is, would you consider revisiting proportional representation of some sort? Why or why? And your question is addressed to Well, I think Dave and Phil. Dave and Phil. Dave first and then Phil. Well, I'm glad you said revisit because it was put on the docket in uh, two elections ago um, when there was a citizenship assembly for the entire province and they came back with a model that was to be voted on. I think it was flawed in terms of the proposal and I think it was flawed in terms of the process. So I'm going to put that on the table. I believe they should have given us a year to analyze and debate and understand what the model was. Although it was a, a, a good first step towards moving into a different way of looking at how proportional uh, representation works. Um, I, I'm going to tell you flat out, I would, wouldn't have a problem with revisiting it at all. I think it's, I think it's uh, worthy of, uh, of debate and discussion. And importantly, process driven. Importantly, process driven. Make sure that there's no hooks, there's no games, there's no tricks. Get the information out, vote on a process that everyone would feel comfortable with using. Well, I can. Uh, Thank you, Nora. This is a great concern for me because when, when I was MPP in Brantford years ago, a typical turnout rate for a provincial election was 70, 72, 73 percent. Federal elections back then, you could easily see 80 percent turnout. Now for a provincial, we're looking at 50 to 55, uh, and uh, federal, I think, something just over 60 percent. So we do need to do something to get more people to exercise their franchise. Um, I, 
the, ver the referendum question that was put several elections ago was flawed. A lot of people didn't understand it and therefore rejected it out of hand. I, I am open to revisiting not only proportional representation, but I think we should look at other options. The possibility of internet voting. Uh, we should look at everything. We need to get more people participating in our democracy. And so the short answer, Nora, is I'm open to anything we can reasonably do that, that would reach that, that goal. Thank you. Tom? Well, I love proportional representation. It means the little voices get a little bit heard. Now, as for the 50% and the demoralizing, depressing turnout, look what you got to look at. They come here, they barely read their written statements. Boring. Couldn't you at least memorize it? I come here with something to say and just say it. And they got to come here and read? Anyway, with proportional representation, you have a chance to get me. Recently, I've come across a 
big conservative size. I see her come out and she says, well, my husband passed away 15 years ago, and I let them put it out there as a tribute to my, my, my husband. I gave her one of our choice books, and she said, well, you can have my vote, but the sign stays. And uh, that's a prime example where people can, can, can voice their opinions on their candidate and their party. I love the idea that at some point there could be some fringe of candidates that are elected to Queens Park and they offer a lot of opinions. That's where it starts. Thank you. Thank you, Bob.
this would create jobs. Um, and we know that that hasn't happened, otherwise we wouldn't be in this situation now. So, you know, this is worrying that the Conservatives' plan is a 30% tax cut, because as you say, you're very right. If that kind of tax cut worked, we would not be having a problem with good jobs locally. So, you know, I hear your frustrations, uh, and, and I echo the importance of continued good services and, and a sense of stability and um, hope for the future that we're not continually going back to the drawing board again and again. Thank you. Thank you. John? Well, it's true. Reinvent failure. Reinvent failure. Reinvent failure. Reinvent failure. Constant reinventing failure. Well, guess what? Expecting something different from doing the same is the definition of insanity. And not wanting to know what anybody but the same three who are constantly failing is the epitome of stupidity. Uh, thanks very much. I think part of what you're uh, asking about is why isn't there more long-term thinking in government that puts people first and puts good policy first. And that's uh, a real question that we still haven't heard the answer to in the responses that we've heard so far. We've heard three different approaches. We've had, heard three very partisan uh, approaches to how we would uh, make different decisions. And we have talked about character to a certain extent. But I think even the reason that we're in this election is for the wrong reasons. I think the reason that this election, the reason that it was called, was not based on good thinking for Ontario. It was based on partisan interest. And that is the challenge that we're finding. There is too much partisanship in the decision making and too much long term thinking. And it goes, or too much short term thinking is designed to buy votes. I think the opposition forgets its job once it gets to uh, Queen's Park. The job of the loyal opposition is to hold the government accountable. It forgets that it's too busy trying to prove that it's going to get into government or that it can do the job better to have any long term thinking. And that's why we we see this. We need to return long-term thinking to Queen's Park that puts people in good policy first. And one of the ways to do that is to go back to proportional representation. One of the points I wanted to make is that the people that are doing that are interested in working together. How many voices have you heard up here tonight of people that are willing to work together when they get to Queen's Park, that are willing to work together collaboratively to make good decisions for the people of Ontario in the long run? That's what I encourage you to look for. Look for people that are willing to work together to get the best ideas and put them to work for the people of Ontario. On June 12th, that's what we want to find in Queen's Park. We have time, I think, for two more questions. Uh, I'll recognize the gentleman on my left, and if anybody has one more question, I'll recognize one after him. Your name, sir, and where you live. Dave Thompson, St. George. Thank you, thank you all coming to our little party tonight. I'm one of the organizers. Um, I'm going to open a can of worms that's um, pretty close to what's going on here in St. George, so I'm going to bring up Timco. Okay. Timco Foods managed to open up a rendering plant in St. George area through deceit. And I want to, I'm want i going to go with this question a little bit different for you. So for all you out there was, when these companies come in, like the Mushroom Coalition out in Burford and the Timco plant here in St. George, and they tell whatever dog and pony show why they have to to get into a community. What would you propose that we do to stop them from profiting from this? Once they're in, right now, we've got the Ministry of Environment, is it John, Ministry of Environment? Yes, it is. Letting Timco use the neighbors in that area as guinea pigs to see if they can fix a problem that was never supposed to be there in the first place. My question, well, that is my question, is what do you propose we do to stop these people? How, do, how can we, if they, if they use deceit to get in and get operating, can't get rid of them. What are you going to do to fix that? You're asking you. Can we start uh, on the, this end of the table this time? Um, there's a, a lot of companies similar circumstances. I know my grandfather's tire and my recycle plant came in and said the same thing. They, they wanted to have this operation. And then they got in under the radar and they started expanding off the road city, transporting uh, tires and stuff. So the deceit is very important to me. And I think that. Yeah, well, the is an old property rights. To stop using easy employment uh, connections 
to, uh, to actually put people first. And, and, and these companies that are doing this, uh, we should be held accountable. I mean, we're here, you can find people if we're walking down the street with local liquor, but we can't find the big corporations that do the political parties. I mean, that's wrong, is you guys need to be first. Thank you. I will, uh, I will be brief on this one. I think we have to put the people first and not the corporations. And I think part of the challenge that we find is that as, as people, we have a process that we have to go through to get permission, and if it doesn't work or we don't follow the rules, then we just stop immediately. And part of the problem was that action wasn't taken uh, swift enough to deal with the problem, and that a solution should have been um, should have been required before they were allowed to continue to operate. If the problem wasn't supposed to exist, then it should have um, been fixed before it continues to operate. And we need to apply that fairly and evenly to everyone. Well, thank you for picking up from that position. What I would like to, to, to thank Ken about is that bringing in a sense of reality. If we spent all of our time saying no to people, then we would not be moving forward at all. What we have to do is balance this with the proper understanding of the rules and regulations that already exist. And I would say to you that through my office and the work of some of the staff, and plus myself, we were able to work with the Minister of the Environment to try to move the, the company from completely abandoning the community altogether and taking that employment. And somebody wants to uh, belittle the employment opportunity of new company moving in, that's one thing. But to simply turn around and say, I just don't want them here, so let's figure out a rule to get rid of them, is not going to work. It's not realistic. It's not, it's not, it's not factual. The law was followed. And if the law was broken, we need to have them to correct it. And we did get them to mitigate it when they didn't want to mitigate it at all. So the reality is, is that the system worked. The Minister of the Environment put a stop order on them. And quite frankly, until they got the buffers in, they weren't going to be allowed to operate. So I think you have to do things within reason and make sure that all of the, the, the value that is being brought from both sides is appreciated and used. So I think in terms of TIMCO itself, if there's evidence, instead of just saying it, if there's evidence that they deceived the government, deceived the three levels of government, because the municipality was involved in this as well, they have rights as well. So if they, if that company deceived three levels of government and somebody caught it, they should not be allowed to operate. Okay. I think, uh, I find it a little surprising that a rendering plan was originally approved for a location that's so close to the village. Uh, and I, I frankly wonder what the municipality was thinking at that time. Now this company faced charges and was closed down temporarily in 2012. They're back operating, as, as Dave said, with some buffers in place that were required of them. And now uh, we're waiting, MOE air quality testing was completed on April 30th. Uh, so just a couple of weeks back, and I guess we're waiting to see what the MOE has to say about how it's how it's operating now. Um, I, but I, I mean, I really feel for the residents to have to have an operation like that so close really affects your quality of life. Having your windows open, having the kids be able to play outside without noxious fumes is obviously a great concern. So I guess what I'd say right now is let's see what comes of the latest round of MOE testing. Uh, and if uh, something further needs to be done beyond that, uh, let's be open to whatever actions are necessary. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, I, I certainly understand the concerns around the noxious odors and, and the concerns about the safety and the enjoyment of people's property uh, in the village. Uh, and I'm, I would want to know, uh, you know, what's going on here to ensure that as, as uh, Dave has said, if there are rules broken, we need to hold people to account uh, because it's just not acceptable um, for us to have a company come in that's going to greatly decrease property values, right? that's going to cause concern for families in St. George. So you know, I would certainly encourage you um, that, that if you have information, this needs to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Well, they're just too big. They have too much power, and these guys can promise you all they want, and there's nothing they're going to be able to do. Me! I got to see my knife. You guys got no humor, and the video is going to show it. They're going to see you guys missing every joke. God, my knife! I got an edge. I thought it was a great joke. Uh, my name is
name is Mike and uh, I'm uh, from London, Ontario. Uh, my question is about post-secondary education. Um, I'm a new professor at King's University College at Western. And there's some things that are, I'm seeing in the platforms that are a bit concerning that I'd like to hear your thoughts on. So the NCP is proposing a tuition freeze, but I did not see anything in the platform about compensating the universities for the lost revenue. The tuition freeze has no end date, but yet university I, I, I do please not too much uh, university costs are increasing, but yet... That, that's, not, uh, that's not a question. What is your question? <coughs> My question to the panel is, how do you justify your education policies in a way that's not going to hurt universities and families, whether a 30% tuition increase in the part of PCs or tuition fees? That's a good question. Now, to whom do you want to address it? I, I would address it to, uh, to Alex <coughs> and to Nancy Phil. Alex Alex question. Uh, the Democrats, we recognize that in order to have a good quality of life, it's kind of become a prerequisite that students go on to post-secondary education, whether that be university or colleges or trades. Uh, but the cost has become a real barrier, not only um, as they are students and when they are students, the cost of living is rising. Uh, many students uh, have childcare expenses as well. Uh, we don't want that to be a barrier, especially for parents who want to go back to school and provide a better future for their children. So that's why we've said we're going to freeze tuition rates. And we're also going to make the um, provincial portion of interest zero for OSAP. Because when students are graduating and they've got about $30,000 of debt, and they meet their partner who also has $30,000 of debt, and perhaps um, as a PhD uh, student, you, you are paying these, uh, these debts uh, as a new professor, then we know that it's almost impossible to think about how could you ever afford to buy a home? How could you ever afford to have children and pay for childcare uh, and, and get married uh, if you have $60,000 of combined debt hanging over you? And that's, that's, the, um, that's the priority of the Democrats, making sure that education is available and affordable to many more people than it currently is. Thank you. Thank you. I think your question is also addressed to... Well, it was basically my question as, how do you... You want to show your point of view? Yes, Phil is well about the 30% of the question. Sure. That's fine. Thank you. Um, I heard a lot of stories uh, around around town and in the county of, of people that it's heartbreaking really. You have people graduating from undergrad programs with debt of $30,000, $35,000 and not finding jobs. Uh, and, uh, and I hear it from parents, I hear it from grandparents, you know, that, uh, that the graduates are not finding jobs, they're living at home, they're still in their room, they're in the rec room, they don't know what they're going to do, they can't begin to pay back the debt they have. I think we have to do a better job of matching people uh, going into programs with the uh, with with where the opportunities are going to be in, in the workforce in the marketplace. So locally, a big concern for me. We've had a tremendous success with Wilfrid Laurier with with the campus in Brantford. Uh, I want to see us have similar success with college and training uh, programs because Mohawk College has all but left. Brantford. We once had a thriving campus on uh, Elgin Street. It's gone. Uh, I want to see more local opportunities uh, for training and apprenticeship and college here because, frankly, I think for those graduates, that's where more of the jobs are. Thank you. I'm going to exercise my, well, don't do that. my hammer tonight. I used up the time of the question period. I got a one-liner. It's not part. fair. Shot. We now come to that portion of the meeting where each of the candidates... God, I had a good one-liner there. Oh, shit. If you want to stay in the hall, I'll be quiet. What? Who's going to move me? Me. Want that? You want what badge? Me you can't too. touch me. <laughs> Wake up. I got a badge. John, John, we've been invited to... Just warning you, he's got to have a badge to touch me and he's unaware. And I'll charge him with assault. So go away, I'll be good. Am I right? Any lawyers up there? All right. I'm invulnerable. 
My mouth is controlled at my volition. The closing statements of the candidates will be for two minutes each. We will go in the reverse order of that in which they started. And that brings us to Phil Gilly. You're on. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you again to, uh, to the organizers, for the Residents Association, uh, for the invitation. Thank you all for a very interesting evening. I think it's particularly interesting for us because this is the first debate of this, uh, of this campaign. I think we have four or five coming up, uh, but having the opportunity of meeting with you first in St. George uh, has been great and uh, very stimulating. Um, I just want to say uh, what I'm finding as I go and talk to people throughout the writing, as I go to doors, I talk to people in the coffee shops. And I'm running into a lot of despondency, a lot of people throwing their hands up. They feel that government has not been responsive to their needs. They read about multi-billion dollar scandals and they despair of how their representatives are spending their money. They worry about the future. And, and they're worried about the ever-increasing cost that they face as a household or a small business. Hydro rates keep going up and up. Taxes keep going up and up. And every proposal they see come forward, particularly in recent budgets from the Liberal Party, is reaching further and further into their pockets. And what I hear is, it, does it have to be this way or can we change? And that, that is when I see their faces light up is when I tell people, it doesn't have to be this way. We can change. We can run a leaner, more efficient government that is more respectful of you and your money. And that is what I'm promising if I should be elected on June the 12th. I will only have one set of bosses if I win this election, and that's all of you. I look forward to that opportunity. Thank you again very, very much uh, for your stimulating questions and comments tonight. Thank you, Phil. The next speaker is Alex Kelsky. Uh, Phil has hit the nail on the head. We know that on June 12th, people will be making a choice, and overwhelmingly at the doorsteps, people are saying they're ready for change. They're ready for change that's going to focus on their priorities to make life affordable to create good jobs, and to make sure we have access to health care. Now, when we make this choice, please keep me in mind. I want to go to Queen's Park to work hard for you. And that's why I'm out door knocking every day, all day. And I'm so grateful to the organizers for providing chairs for us, because my feet are quite sore, so thank you for that. Um, I'm really serious about working hard to uh, advocate on your behalf. Um, to make sure that we have a better future and that we can look to a government who is going to respect our tax dollars. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. The next speaker is Bob Perks. One thing I want to come on the organizers um, I think I will we'll talk a little bit tonight about uh, the importance of voting. Uh, regardless of big flawed system or who you support, they need to get out and vote. Um, I, one thing I, uh, I need to mention is, if the Selections Ontario has a special ballot, they will come and see you as a disabled. And that's very important. I haven't heard any of the other candidates promote this because it is something that's vitally important in our community. The disabled the seniors can get out and vote. Um, I, I think that the mistakes of big government cannot be fixed by yet more government. So on June 12th, I ask for your support and trust in your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. The next speaker is Ken Burns. Well, thanks very much. We've uh, certainly had some good conversations tonight, and there's uh, lots to consider in, in this election for us to focus on good policy and, and long-term thinking um, in uh, future governments that puts people first. One thing that we haven't talked about very much tonight, and we sort of did in the, in the opening question, but is protecting our farmland and source water. And we really need to do that to protect our farmland and support our farm industry here in, uh, here in Ontario and <coughs> in Grant County. The aggregate extraction is a huge issue. 
locally that needs to have more discussion and more focus in our in our community. We just saw another 225 acres of uh, prime farmland, class one and class two farmland get rezoned for aggregate extraction in our community. Provincially right now the province prioritizes gravel over food and water and to me that's just insanity. We need food and water to live, we need to be able to protect our own uh, food security. There are other sources of aggregate than virgin gravel, particularly where it comes from class one and two farmland. Many people don't know we all only have about 0.5% of Ontario's area is prime farmland and we've already developed 20% of it. We've already developed 20% of the prime farmland in uh, Ontario. We need to protect and work. The Green Party is committed to protecting class one farmland from development and that's a beginning. We need to do more. I'm already getting uh, my sign. I want to encourage uh, Brantford and Brant and Six Nations to work together so that we focus on building up and not spreading out, that we do protect our development. Beyond that, I really encourage us to continue to work together collaboratively, collaboratively as communities and as future uh, representatives at Queen's Park. The future of returning good policy to decision making is based on working together and long term sustainable things. Thank you, Thank you and vote on Paul. Okay, so you remember how the professors kept their jobs in Argentina by insisting on being paid with bonds at the use for hybrid taxes, medical and licenses. Well, you remember earlier I mentioned how the definition of insanity was doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result? And the definition of stupidity was not wanting to know any new ideas? Well, I said only asking for three out of six was the definition of stupidity, and the professor stands up and says, I want to hear two. So, guess what? I'm here, and you may think I've been dumping on Dave because all those suicided single mothers because they didn't set up a lead system. Then, of course, nobody else would have either. Nobody else, no other elected politician has ever bothered to listen. The voters look at me and they laugh, never get elected, doesn't have a fleet of cars to transport a bunch of brain-dead voters to the polls, never going to win, John Turmel, politics ain't serious. Well, the blood ain't on Dave Levac's hands for all those dead poor people. It's on the hands of the voters who put him there. So you go home and sleep at night, and you try, and remember, you're the guys put him there, so do nothing Dave, did nothing for 11 years, while you guys could have had a Let's Time Bank working in your system with John the Engineer. And I'm pissed off at your stupidity. On tape. Job. I appreciate that very much, and I also appreciate the people that have come out tonight. And for those that have stuck it out, uh, John Worstein, Dave Thompson, I'm going to work with you guys to get air conditioning for the. For the <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll do what we can to help you out there. Um, listen, I uh, I've dedicated my life to, to this community. Uh, I've dedicated uh, all of my leadership and the capacity that I have in order to bring us together to try to work together to play together, to live together. Um, it's unfortunate that, that, that we can't have a dialogue without insult, a dialogue without... Uh, Dead people, Dave! Day. Fuck your insult! Oh, oh, Dead people! Here's a man Who's talking insult? insult? The door's there. Yeah, yeah, are you gonna move me up, lady? Hey, hey. Uh, you want to bring me up? I get a one-liner. We invited you here. He tonight. talked about me. He talked about me going without a badge. He talked about me. I don't care. I'm going to come and you'll need a badge. Everybody needs a badge if they want to keep me out. You know that. I was arrested four times last election, and this some bitch tricked me into getting arrested once. John! And I, uh, Go ahead, Dave. I will uh, offer my respect, as I always have, to anybody that wants to share their opinion. Uh, I will still be respectful regardless, but the reality is... I've got no respect for you, Dave. There's a difference. So, so, the, so, the re so the reality is that I've dedicated my life to try to help this community to be the best it can. I will intend to, I intend to continue to do that. I want us to all look at all of the policies. 
digest them, make sure that you understand what they are actually saying, and then you'll find that some of those policies are going to hurt our community. I told Lots. all men, I told Kathleen men, and I'm telling anybody. I've worked with James Stewart, I've worked with Lloyd St. Amant, I've worked with Phil McCollin, I've worked with Mayor Eddie, I've worked with the councillors. You got nothing done! Sure, sure, sure. The capacity that we have when we work together, there's no one in this room that's smarter than all of us together. I am. And therefore, we now know how to vote. One line is Quite frankly, the, the, the ability for us all to work together is what I have sought all my life. And I've thought of my parents a long time ago that you get success when you work with everybody together. Well, you got none yet, Dave. Enough. I bring this to the end of our formal meeting tonight.